by Kijun. The header is good, and it's the Thai defender John Tae Wook, and eventually a career has broken the deadlock. You're listening to the K League United podcast. Proud partner of Football Nation Radio. Hello, my name is Heo. Ryan Walters in the K League United bunker, joined this week by Dan Croydon. Hello. And from Gim J, making interesting dinners. It's Pete Hampshire. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm still I'm reeling a little bit from the fish <laughs> pasta with a tomato sauce that you were describing. <laughs> we are culinary geniuses down here in Gim J. We know we know what goes. Salmon, tomato, broccoli, peppers. Oof. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, all those together, yes. But a tomato sauce, I I don't know. But anyway, speaking of fancy meals, Dan, we can't uh, we can't go any further without mentioning the fact that it is your wedding anniversary, sir. It is indeed. So I'm spending a romantic evening in with uh, with you, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know you've got a marriage that's going to last when you can spend <laughs> your wedding anniversary yes. with the two of us talking about K League One and Two. Right. Yeah, I mean, well, we went out to lunch, though. We, we went out to lunch. <laughs> as, as all couples are well-renowned to do on their anniversaries, oh, we had a nice lunch spot. Yeah. There you go. You should have come around, right. come around to mine for dinner. You'd have loved it. <laughs> right. I, 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 I'm in tomato pasta today. For three. We had, right. We had a nice steak, and uh, we were supposed to be spending the night in Busan. Uh, but, uh, well, things have kicked off here, of course, as probably most people know. <sighs> yeah. So uh, we had that and then various things. So it just became just lunch, uh, but a very nice lunch it was. Yeah, and you touched on it there. If people don't know what you mean by kicked off is that Corona is back here in Korea. Uh, there's been a spike recently and... Who knows? I mean, we're recording this early in the week. This might even affect this weekend's games, the way that things are going right now. So hopefully hopefully we can stay in quarantine level two, which is where we are right now, because if it goes up to quarantine level three, that means K-League has to shut down. We all cry into our beers and remember what life was like without football. So let us hope that that does not happen. So uh, if you're listening here in Korea, stay home, wear a mask, don't touch anything. I want my (laughs) K-League. (laughs) <laughs> and I want you healthy. I want you healthy, happy and healthy, but mainly selfishly, I just want my K-League. And after a week out of the studio, we are back to talk about the K-League action. We uh, took last week off to kind of just, there was a little bit of a conversation on Twitter going on about coaching, so it felt like a nice time to rebroadcast the coaching episode from last year. But now we're back, and oh boy, what a difference a couple of weeks off makes. Inch on United... We're going to be talking about them today. We've just got a couple of topics that we're going to go through, including The Great Escape. It's on. Never publicly. Doubt Inchun. Ever. Junior Negrao has 20 goals already this season. We'll be talking about him and what that means for Dan's Ulsan Hyundai. We're talking about the rise of Gyeongnam FC, the, a, a team that we picked preseason. Didn't look like it was going to work out. It's working out right now. Speaking of things that, uh, well, are or aren't working out, we're going to talk about Kim byung Su, maybe... Need to hit the exit door at Gangwon FC because things are not going well there. And then we have a chock full mailbag. This thing is absolutely stuffed. One week off of the pod, and I think uh, people are chomping at the bit. So thank you so much for getting those in, and we'll get to those at the end. But, gentlemen, as I said, we, there's nowhere else to start this week. We have to start with this. The Great Escape is on. Incheon United with back-to-back wins against Daegu and Suwon now have Incheon just three points behind Suwon Samsung Blue Wings for 11th place and safety. This exciting times, Pete, exciting times. Yeah, I mean, the match itself against Suwon wasn't too exciting, was it? But um, they got the victory, they got the three points, six points in two games. And uh, recently, I think the signs of improvement were there against uh, Gwangju and Songnam. They Mm -hmm. had plenty of shots on target in those games, just couldn't keep it out at the back. Um, Against Suwon, they kind of relinquished possession a bit I thought and just let Suwon pass it around in front of them and then struck them that lovely free kick it was a quick thought free kick from uh, Kim Do Hyuk who caught the Suwon defense off guard absolutely criminal defending from Suwon 
criminal defending, but and again, if you haven't seen this, it's out on Twitter on the K League main account. Song Xiu with that goal, just this is a goal that we don't see that often in K League, or I mean, honestly, in a lot of leagues, because he's got a decent look at the net right away in the box, but doesn't mm-hmm. take that shot. I think he had a decently clear shot. Could have tried to go top corner or something. Goes around not one, not two, but three defenders, leaves them looking like fools, and then just pops it in. I mean, the the composure on that, especially for somebody that hasn't scored in such a long time, you know, he hasn't scored since coming back from his military service with Sangju Sangmu, and, uh, you know, Inchun's been struggling all year to have that poise to go ahead and get that game winner I think that, to me, is indicative of the confidence boost that this team has right now. Yeah, and Cho Tung Hwan, he showed some bold bold management in that second half. He took off Aguilar for mm-hmm. Song Xiu, and that obviously proved fruitful. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm really happy that they've kept two clean sheets in a row. Both exactly. Those, uh, both those are one-nil wins. You know, they have been shipping goals for a while there, uh, you know, they're never really going to score that many. They're not the most attacking team. And so they've got to base it on a sound defense. If they got organized at the back now, yeah, as you say, the great escape, it's on. Yeah, never doubt it. And uh, interestingly enough, Paul put together, because Paul is Paul, this deals with Dejan Hanna Citizen, then Dejan Citizen, as they were known, Paul put a piece together comparing 2015 Dejan and this year's Incheon United. And since promotion and relegation was introduced in 2013, the lowest point total belongs to Daejeon. That that year they finished with just 19. But after 15 matches played that season, Daejeon had one more point than Incheon did at the same point this year. They had six compared to Incheon's five. And we all know what happened to Daejeon that year. It, again, it was the lowest points total. They were relegated. And um, now they have Hong Sun Hong as their manager and things are going interestingly. But I think it's a very interesting comparison. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, doing a bit of math of my own, actually, here. Okay. To rival Mr. Neat. <laughs> actually, this, this point, this season, they have 11 points after 17 games, right? Correct. Would you, would you be surprised if I said that was the exact same case last year? I would not. Games, I would not, because points. it's Incheon. That sounds about right. <laughs> right? But here's the thing. This isn't a regular season. That's the first thing to bear in mind. They've only got 27 games in which to do it. So they've, they've got 10 games left now. And so you've kind of got to look at, in the past, how many points teams have finished 11th, how many points they've gained to finish 11th and avoid automatic relegation. And, and then I've tried to factor that in, and I got it at around, they need 23 to 24 points. So they'll need another 12, 13 points to escape. Ooh, that is, games. that's a pretty big ask. And this actually leads in perfectly. Uh, the mailbag is so full that we did decide to get one out of the mailbag. We're bringing it in here. It's from Inchun Luke, good friend of the show, Inchun Luke. Uh, and he's asking, if the great escape comes to fruition, which, you know, of course it's going to, who will go down in Inchun's place? Because this year, and we'll touch on this in the mailbag as well, Sangju Sangmu is automatically being relegated, so there's just that one position. Sangju's not going to finish 12th, so there will not be a promotion relegation playoff this year. So whoever's 12th is going down. That's all there is to it this year. So he's asking if it's not Incheon, who's it going to be? And he says he doesn't think it'll be Suwon. And uh, I actually, before I get to you guys on this one, Suwon, I I. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it is going to be them because their three wins this season came against Gwangju, Sangnam, and Incheon. So those are three teams that would be in the relegation round. And they had five draws that came mostly against top half opposition other than Gangwon and Busan. They have just two losses from relegation round opposition with Gwangju and the most recent one to Incheon. So point being in all of this that I think that they would fare well if they were in the relegation round if they can figure out how to score, because they're not scoring as much as the other teams. And <laughs> oddly enough, it would uh, benefit Suwon if they weren't at home for a lot of those games because they just don't play well at home. But yeah, I think Luke's got a good point here. If it's not Incheon, then who's it going to be? Pete, what do you think? I agree with Luke as well. I think Suwon have just got that touch of quality when it matters. I actually think if it's going to be anyone, it'll be one of the two promoted sides. I'm sat here in a, a Guangzhou shirt, but I think if... Felipe was to get injured as one of the league's most fouled players. I think he's third. And then if one of those top three for Guangzhou, uh, Willian, Omwon Sang or Felipe go, they don't have the quality, they don't have the strength in depth. They could easily go on a slump. Or, or similarly, Busan. If um, yeah. 
if, if he don't June does move, I, I know clubs are bidding for him. If he does leave, then they've lost a lot of creativity that they don't have on the wings if he's absent. And for him, you've got to say, I mean, I've seen rumors of Portugal and everything else. I think if that, if Europe comes calling right now, you got to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got to take the opportunity. So I'd say one of those two. What about you, Dan? I saw a lot of uh, Usain the other night uh, winning at home to Poham. I think that they'll be all right. I mean, Incheon have been there before. Suwon haven't. I, I, I can't look past Suwon. They've got one point in the last five games. They're on such a bad run. But they haven't got a manager. They haven't got a leader to take them through this. I just don't see them. They, they need about 10 points from the last 10 games. That's three wins one, in a one row. Thing that, one thing that doesn't count in Incheon's favour is they've just built up this momentum from two home wins and then the next three games are all the way from home. That won't help. Right. Yeah, and the thing mm-hmm. for Suwon right now, going into the weekend right now, they have Busan, and then after that they have Sangju. Not easy. They've got the super match after that, then Pohong and Gangwon. That's not a tremendously easy stretch of games. And then, you know, the matches that we didn't mention there are the ones that are going to follow in the uh, maybe, well, definitely the relegation round for them, given their current form. So not an easy way to finish it out for them, having just lost to Jumbok and Incheon in back-to-back games. So I think going into the the split, things are going to be pretty rough for them there. So who knows? Maybe Incheon can, uh, they can get out of this again, because that's just, that's just what Incheon does. But that's what we think is going to happen. To get an insider's perspective of the Great Escape 2020, which we've been saying all year, been saying it all year, our Paul Neat recently spoke to their talisman striker, Stefan Magosa. Uh, unfortunately, due to some recording issues, uh, you'll hear a little bit of it in this uh, abbreviated version. We couldn't post the entire thing on here. The, there was a misconnection with the phone line, but the full interview has been transcribed by Paul and is on kleague.com right now. But for now, here's Magosa in his own words. Stefan, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. How are you? Yes, uh, thank you so much for calling me, invite me. Uh, I'm so good. I'm, I'm happy now because last game we win after a long time and now I'm, I'm really happy. Yeah, that was the first thing I was going to ask you. Just how good did it feel after that win against Degu? Because, you know, for you, as you scored the winning goal. Wow, for, for, of course, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, after maybe... 260 days uh, we win the game. It's a really long time without winning, but uh, now I think we have a uh, possibility to, to, to beat at home this uh, so on and, and, and count for the just three points between us. And uh, I think Inchon is now a stronger team than before and we, we, we keep fighting until the end, of course. Sure, and you just said there, 262 days. You, you even counted the days. That's that's incredible. Yes, yes, yes. It's really, really, really incredible uh, things, but this is football. Yes. Of course. yes. As a, a striker, when you haven't scored for a while or if the team hasn't won, do you put any extra a pressure on yourself? Do, do you feel that? Of course, uh, because in the last two years in Incheon, I scored a lot of goals. Uh, first year, I scored 19, and second year, I scored 14. And when you don't score uh, maybe six, seven or eight games, of course, you have some like pressure. But uh, everyone in the club support me, especially fans, because we have really, really good relationship. Uh, and everybody love me. And uh, of course, I, I, I keep uh, working hard. And uh, now we deserve to win this game and I score. And it is important for me because I have all support from the whole club. Sure, yeah. And people often say about a striker or a player that relies on the confidence of scoring goals that once he scores one, then many more will follow. Is that how, yes. is that how you feel now? Yes, yes. I think this is, this is really the right thing for the striker, especially for the striker. Uh, if you don't score a long time, and then you score, especially goal for, for, for three points. I think you get uh, more confidence and you are ready for the continue to scoring. All right. Well, Stefan, um, one final question then. What message do you have for the Incheon fans? Yeah, I have a message. Uh, first, I have to say to them that uh, thank big, big thank you for supporting this whole season. And uh, 
we keep fighting together till the last game and uh, I hope we we can survive in this year like last year and for me I'm so sorry this corona is it's 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 bad for us because with with our fans we have more more much more chance to to survive this league but I know they are support us of course from outside and uh, we will we will give 100% for them Sure. And also, actually, before I forget, I seem to remember there were some Inchon fans that went to go and watch you at Wembley playing for Montenegro. Yes, yes, what, yes. What, I, that must have been a huge surprise. I was surprised. I was surprised I played like 6-2, like, uh, cry, and uh, somebody called me, Stefan, Stefan. I say, what is this now? And then I turn, <laughs> and I saw maybe five, six, like, uh, Korean people in, in, in blue and black shirt and wow. they say, oh, you are Pagaman finisher, like you are blue and black finisher and sing my song like this Stepan Mugosha and I was so happy and this is I uh, too much respect for this, this these people. Yeah, it just shows it just shows how good, how how great the Inchon fans are and yes. um, and how important that they are for for the team and the players but um stefan thank you very much for your time good luck for obviously the the weekend and for the rest of the season thank you so much brother. thank you fnr is a revolutionary football dedicated digital platform the first of its kind in australia it provides a 24 7 live online radio platform experience podcast hub and acts as a content provider for tv radio and digital Having reached millions of listeners and football fans since launching, FNR is accessible worldwide via its website or app, providing a platform to discuss, debate and celebrate the world game. We are your voice of football, FNR Football Nation Radio. Welcome back to the Kayleigh United Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Walters, joined by Pete Hampshire. Hello. And the man that we, well, I'm not going to say we brought you on just for this, but it's Dan Croydon and Dan... I figure you'd be happy to talk about it. We're talking about Junior Nagao. I'm definitely happy to talk about it. I could talk about it for hours. Well, Junior, what he, a guy. He just got his 20th goal of the season in 17 appearances. We've been saying he scores when he wants, and he just it really does seem like he just scores when he wants. I mean, 20 goals in 17 games. He went a whopping two games without a goal, and we were all saying, oh, Junior's gone cold. Not anymore. Just got himself a brace over the weekend, and... I mean, first, Dan, how is he doing this this year? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think the answer is is that he's been doing it for a few years now. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, uh, the, the big stat is uh, he's just come up to 100 games in K-League. That includes three seasons with Ulsan, and uh, he had 16 games at Daegu when he first came over. So 100 games, 73 goals. Whew. I've done the math on this. That is 0.73 goals a game. Yeah, that's decent. If you're if you're into that, if you're into that, it's decent. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that that'll get him up um, up at the top of the scoring charts most years. And he has been there. He's just been beaten out by uh, by Marcao 2018. Tagged yeah. by a single goal last year. Of course, Suon finished in the bottom half. Right. Um, and so he had a slightly easier run in at the end there. But yeah, uh, this season he's definitely stepped up a gear. Um, yeah, I, it, I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm sure opposition managers are looking for the answer on how to stop him. I mean, but seemingly no one can. To me, the thing that I love about him is that he just scores in so many different ways. I, I, I love <laughs> a scrappy striker that's just there when you need him. Then they're, they're in the right spot. And he scored a lot doing that this year, but... He does also have the ability to just take it on himself and, and do the thing. He scores with his head as well. I mean, like you say, he's been doing it for a while, and he's looked good doing it. And early in the week, there was a really interesting statistic that was put out about the number of goals in the number of appearances. This season, as we've mentioned, he has 20 goals and 17 appearances. Uh, other noteworthy goal scorers, Edon Guk had 14 in 16 back in 2009. Uh, Udus Jeric, that's right, talking about Udus Jeric again. Because, I mean, for those that are new to K-League, the reason that we talk about him so much with Gyeongnam and a team that we're going to get to next here, he had just such a phenomenal 2018. He had 14 goals and 18 appearances. 
Dayon's record-setting season, he had 13 goals and 17 appearances, which is seven behind what Junior's doing right now. And Tiago Elves, the move that got him over to the Middle East in 2016, he had 13 goals and 18 appearances, but that proved to be a little bit of a purple patch there. Uh, I think the one that stands out for me is Dayon's because that was the year that Dayon set the single-season record with 31 goals, and if this isn't a shortened season, I think we're 100% certain that Junior breaks this, or, or am, I just, am I just out too far on a limb here, Pete? No, he still could could break it even in a shortened season. I mean, this this year is on 0.7 goals per game, so it's a bit lower than Dan's fantastic maths there this year. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, we're gonna. Talk, I don't know how you did that, Dan. <laughs> wow, it took me ages. Yeah. But, okay. Um, no, I've got some more impressive stats here if you want them. Always. He only need, he needs two more goals to beat Dan's goal rate in that 2011 okay and he needs just four more 10 games left he needs just four more for the best ever goals to game ratio he would beat Marcao, who set the record in 2018 with i believe 27 goals in 31 games so So, he needs only four more uh, goals in 10 10 games to be the best goals per game scorer in k-league history he might do that this weekend the way that he's going (laughs) right (laughs) I think this is, you know, we knew that there was going to be, aside from the fans not being in the stadium for a long time and then being able to come back and then being taken out, on the field, we knew there were going to be some issues with a shortened season. And we've talked a lot about it being, about it being in Chun and other things happening in the relegation battle and not having enough games. But I mean, man, the season that we're seeing from Junior right now, it is a big shame that we're not going to be able to see those extra couple of matches this year. And I, it's it's just a shame that the comparisons have to come down to goals per game and things like that because right. we're, we're never going to be able to talk about this season without talking about the fact that it was a shortened season and all these other things going on with it. But it, it's just such an accomplishment from him. And, uh, yeah, as, we, as we're always saying, anybody that's seen an interview with him or spoken with him, he's truly just such a nice guy. You really just wish him well and i mean all of us that aren't jumbook fans i think are wishing him well this year just so we can have somebody else lift that trophy yeah. so uh, hopefully he keeps well, it I'm up worried, i'm worried about next year uh, i know his contract's up and he's going to turn 34 um, but if he's had a season like this ulsan have to sign him again they've got to keep him on well i think he's happy in ulsan you know he said that he said that he feels Absolutely. treated really well and i think at the age that he's at right now I think it would either be one more big money move. I think if China or the Middle East come calling and they're going to give him a massive contract, I think that's hard to say no to at the age of 34. Mm -hmm. But if if the salaries are comparable and he can stay at Ulsan, I I think that would be massive. And I think he would be pivotal to them challenging for the title again next year. But let's see if they can get it this year first. They're they're only in the lead by one point, but I, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens this off season and to just kind of follow the progression of his his outstanding year. And yeah, again, to me, the shame is that we have to have all these qualifiers and everything else next to it of a shortened season, no fans in the stands. And but I, I think when it comes to what we've seen on the field of play, this is just one of the hands down best seasons that we've seen. And you might as well just give him the MVP right now, in my opinion. Nobody comes close. Well, so. that's, that's what we thought about Felipe last year in the K2, and he, d- he didn't win it. I don't. I, <laughs> not, that, I don't, not that I'm bitter. I not that I'm bitter. <laughs> Still don't like talking about it. <laughs> but, I yes. don't see Junior having a massive bust up or getting a red card. I don't think he's ever been sent off in his career, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, I, d- I don't see Junior getting somehow missing out on it because of disciplinary issues, which... If you don't know no. about that, that's what happened to Felipe last year when he just destroyed K League Two and was far and away the MVP. But can't say that Edong Jun wasn't a deserving winner as well. Anyway, speaking of K League Two, let's move on and let's talk about K League Two. Let's talk about Gangnam FC. They are currently sat fourth, just four points off the top of the table after 16 rounds. They were in seventh place just two rounds ago and looking well off the pace for a playoff spot. Part of what's got them up here right now is that they've gone six unbeaten, four wins in a row, and they've held four clean sheets during the stretch. And for me, Baek Sung Dong has been the man that's got them here. He's got three goals and four. Not many of them match winners per se, but he, him being a presence on the field, I think is just absolutely massive for them. But, I mean, this is why I love K-League, too, because it's a team preseason that we thought was going to do well. They looked really off the pace. 
you put together a good stretch of games like this and and I mean we say this about so many teams in K-League too and again this is why I love the second division they're right there in the title hunt like you can't say that Gyeongnam's not necessarily in the title hunt they're only four points off of Suwon and Suwon has looked somewhat more human recently yeah I've not watched much of Gyeongnam this season now Gwangju are in the K1 I mean I've just sacrificed the K2 sorry sorry Ryan <laughs> but I did watch the game against Buchon that's your and... loss by the way for the record, that's your loss. K2 is where the party is, my man. <laughs> I watched the game against Buchon, um, knowing that I was coming on here. I might, I might as well uh, treat myself. That's right. And what I noticed was the midfield that dominated Buchon's midfield and I de- delved deep into the K-League stat center after noticing that. Okay. And they had 430 passes to Buchon's 179. Now, Ooh. that is interesting because Buchon have not been sub 300 passes since match day four. So they've completely destroyed whatever good thing Buchan had going in midfield. They've just turned it over. Jang Hyuk Jin, the key passer in the center of the park. And uh, also another thing, which kind of links into that, because they're clearly not just lumping the ball up front because Gyeongnam have only had two offsides in the last four games. The manager, Sulky Hunt, has clearly got them thinking more focused about where they're going to move the ball forward and Wait, how they're going to transition. You mean Route 1 isn't the only way to play football? <laughs> <laughs> and you've been watching Barnsley. That's your, that's your problem if you think that. <laughs> I, I've not watched a ton of Barnsley. Anyway, Dan, get us, off of, get us off of Barnsley. Get us back on track here. Okay, well, I, I want to give a bit of a, a shout-out to their manager, So Ki Hyun. You know, a, a lot of the followers of English football will know him from his time at Wolves and uh, and Reading. Koreans maybe know him from uh, from Ulsan and the national team, of course. He's a, he's a big name. And I think, to be honest, he's not getting much credit because they had a, a bit of a dodgy start, really, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Um, but they everyone saw the, the relegation playoff at the end of last season. Youngnam looked like a team that were out of sorts. Yeah. Things were not particularly going well at that club. So it's understandable that the manager's taken a bit of time to put his stamp on the team. But I, I think he definitely, you know, he, he has turned it around and he should get some credit. The other thing is he's brought in a lot of talented and uh, experienced players yeah. as well. The game winner against Buchon came from uh, Jong Hyuk, who was a, won the league with Jumbo last season. Played in all of their uh, post-split games, started against Ulsan on the, the next to last game of the season. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, experience like that, along with people like Pak Dong up front, Go Kyung Min, all of these guys are 32, 33, been there, done that. And, mm-hmm. you know, in this kind of stage of the season, hot summer nights the, the, you know these are the, the guys you've got to turn to uh, so I don't think it's much of a surprise they've, they've done well recently and that's all you need in K2 of course right you only need a, a, a few wins a, a few a, a decent run unbeaten and you'll be in a, you'll be in contention near the top if it was so easy Dejan would get promoted every year Dan Sorry, Paul's not here. I got to throw them under the bus. Paul's not here. Um, you said that, you, you got to win sometimes rather than draw. Beijing and the, the they draw become draw experts. experts yeah, uh, you said that it's not surprising that they're here, and yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, credit where it's due to Sol Ki Hyun, but I, I think for me, the other thing that's not necessarily surprising is that the unbeaten streak has come against Ansan, who are in ninth. Somehow they managed a point against the mighty Junum Dragons, who are in fifth. But I mean, that was a hard end point. They. Beat Anyang, no surprise there. Anyang are in eighth. The win against Daejeon is impressive. Daejeon's still in third. Then they beat Asan, who are in tenth, and Buchan, who are in seventh. So it's a good run. It is impressive. But up next, they have Suwon, Jeju, and Junnam again. So I think the real test for Gyeongnam is coming in the next three rounds to see what they can do against top tier opposition like that i mean suan and jeju those are two teams that are right there for the title right now Junum is fighting tooth and nail for a playoff spot coming off a win uh who knows what they'll be doing in two weeks time it's k-league two but to me i think this is it's just so beautifully set up for a really fun finish in k-league two when you've got all these teams fighting for the playoff spot and then the playoff spots this year aren't very far behind the title you know so i think 
it, it's it's just all sorts of fun. But for Gyeongnam, it's great seeing them up there. This is a team that we didn't want to just, I didn't anyway, want to see kind of just drop into obscurity after how much fun they were in 2018. So it's nice to see them there. But for me, this the big test is up next. And, and that's not to take away from six games unbeaten and four wins in a row. That's massive. That's amazing. But can they do it against Suwon, Jeju, and Jeonnam? It's about time we had an exciting title race in the K2 as well. Last year, Gwangju <laughs> just ran away with it. And the year before, yeah. was it Asan? Yeah. And then Songnam went up in second. So it's about time we had a, a really exciting end to the season. It's almost as if playoffs make it more interesting and there are teams vying for things <laughs> there. Do, I'm not going to go do my playoff thing. I'm not going to do it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, uh, before I go off on another tangent about why we need playoffs here in Korea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop myself. We'll take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about whether or not Kim byung soo should stay in charge of Gangwon FC. Be right back. Fans, we want to hear from you. You're encouraged to email KLU at info at kleagueunited.com or tweet at Kayleigh United with any questions, comments, or reactions. Or follow us on Facebook to ask directly during one of our live shows. Welcome back to the Kayleigh United Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Walters, joined by Dan Croydon. Hello. And Pete Hampshire. Hello, lads. And Pete, well, this, this I'm not going to lie, this segment's a little painful for me because I love byung Ball. I love the way Gangwon FC plays. But it, ooh, mm, mm, it is getting hard to deny that the results, they're just, they're not there right now. They are winless in seven, winless in seven, and are, are very quickly falling down the table. They're all the way down into eighth right now. I don't think relegation is going to be an issue for Gangwon, but it, it's, it's not working. It's not working. So instead of me crying publicly, what's gone wrong, Pete? I think our our little John up to um to Gangnung, me, you, and Vins, <laughs> that perfectly summed up what was going wrong at Gangwon this season. We played some lovely football, but then Busan just hit them on the break. Lee yeah. Dong Joon and Kim Jin Gu just destroyed them, and in the in the midst of it all, lost you a life on the Survivor. <laughs> Sorry to bring that up. Yeah, but, thanks. Um, thanks. After w- watching the game against Daegu on um on the weekend. It was kind of the polar opposite to that. At least when we went, it was entertaining. The game against Daegu, it looks like they've lost the confidence. It was so dull. It yeah. was the worst game of the weekend for me anyway. I mean, I did pick Gang One on the Survivor. I think. Just to put that out there. <laughs> Someone oh, over here in Gimje has still got a life left. Okay. Um, I think we all yeah. have, haven't we? Aren't we all? I'm, I'm on one. I, I am, I'm Eddie Vettering this right now. I'm still alive. Don't worry, I'm not singing on the podcast this week, but I am very much still alive. K-League Survivor, by the way, for those that might not know, this is something we're doing on Patreon where we where you pick a team that won't lose each week. It sounds easy. It is not, especially when Incheon go ahead and beat Daegu. Luckily, I avoided that bloodbath. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Pete, back to Gangwon, but, you, you were saying. Yeah, that that front three, who have you got? Kim Ji-hyun, Cho Ji-wan, uh, Kim Sung-dae, they were interplaying so nicely before, and it just seems to have stopped. I mean, as far as Kim byung soo leaving... Again, we said it in previous episodes of the podcast. Who would you get in to replace him? Right. I had I, a look at the the options today for available Korean managers. Top of the list were Che Young Soo, <laughs> Im Seng, Im Wan Sop. I mean, none of those have covered themselves in glory lately. So no, I I don't. I mean, no. Che Young Soo <laughs> des- <laughs> <that list. laughs> Che Young Soo deserves a job again at some point. He I think he just lost the locker room. I was mainly just thinking, I, I don't want to always say bad things about E.M. Sang, so I won't say anything. That's just, I'll, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just, that's where I'll leave that. Don't touch Gangwon. Do not go to Gangwon. Anyway, uh, y- yeah, I don't think there's anybody to bring in now, but I mean, the thing that gets me about it is I, the style of play, I think, I, I want it to succeed so badly because it's different from the typical K-League style. It's different from get it out to the wings, get it down the field, pump it into the middle to your tall target striker. And I just love watching a team play in a different way. And when they're on, Gangwon have that identity and they're very entertaining. But 
to me, and, and Dan, I'll bring you in here because to me, where Gangwon really failed this year was the transfer window. And you've got a couple of guys down there in Ulsan that I think would have been a great fit at Gangwon. Jason Davidson would look great in orange. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, he'd look great on a football pitch, but we haven't seen <laughs> Wouldn't much. he just, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think I think you've touched on it there, and that is, they sure, they play some nice football, but, my goodness, the other night against Daegu, they were dull, dull, dull. Yeah. They just don't shoot. It's all square in front of the box. It's looking for that impossible killer pass. And I tell you what, I think, basically, Daegu went there and, and thought, we need, we need a point. Mm-hmm. They just sat there, and they defended so easily mm-hmm. against Gang. They they're a real soft touch, and it's because the manager hasn't got a, a plan B. Yeah, exactly. He hasn't, he hasn't got a player up his sleeve on on the bench there that you can bring on. Two years ago, you had twenty odd goals from Uro Steric. Last year, you had Cho Jong Guk. Jong Jong Guk. Yeah, he'll he'll come off the bench and and grab you a goal in the last ten minutes as as we saw against Paul Hang in that one legendary game. But on the weekend, they just didn't have anyone. They kind of spluttered and, and, and spurted and just couldn't make a, a, a chance towards the end. So Yeah, they'll, terms, they'll be hoping uh, Han Kuk Young comes back as soon as possible in the right. middle. In terms of uh, moving on from the manager, I don't think they necessarily have to change the manager, but they do have to sit him down and say, look, you need to tell us who you want up front. Because we need a we need some kind of plan B for games like that. Because you know they're just a soft touch. If you wanted points in the K League one, who would the manager choose to play right now? I think they'd all cho- choose Gangwon. Well, Suwon's still there. Sorry, Suwon. <laughs> I just can't. I can't say bad things about Incheon publicly. I can say it about anything else. Yeah, I mean you're right though. I think Gangwon. This has been the frustration. Gangwon's going to Gangwon. They're going to be up and down. They're going to put in one of the most entertaining performances of the season, and then they're also going to put in a performance like the one that we keep dogging against Daegu. And, I mean, Daegu also is a team that's tremendously exciting on their day, and they they also came out kind of flat in that one. But the difference is Daegu's in fourth. Daegu's proven it over a longer term. They can afford a result like that. You know, they're winless in three right now, Daegu is, and that's cause for concern. But with Sangju automatically getting relegated, Daegu's in an ACL position right now. So Daegu's fine. Gangwon, however, are looking at another season where they might not finish in the championship round. And like to me, that's just not acceptable for the amount of talent that's here. And the team shouldn't be this dependent on Han Kuk Young. Han Kuk Young is maybe the best midfielder in the league. Maybe. I don't know. Love watching him play. Mm-hmm. But you can't be that dependent on him. You you can't have everything centering on whether or not he's in the lineup. Yes, he's a difference maker by all means, but like you were saying, Dan, I think they have to have a plan B, and they don't right now, and I don't know how much of that is roster building, and I don't know how much of it is the manager. And I well, I mean, I know part of it's roster building, but like you're saying, why isn't he talking to them and saying, okay, get me somebody in, get me somebody else? Especially this year with COVID, it seemed like the time, like it was the perfect time to finally see some intra-league moves where we see some high-profile names move from team to team. And, you know, we did see that with Lars Veldweig moving to Suwon FC from Jumbuk. But to me, why did Gangwon not inquire about him? I mean, if he's going to go and he's going to play for Suwon FC, a team that he said himself already had an amazing striker, which they do in An Byung Jun, he was a perfect fit for Gangwon. Just chuck him up top, and we've seen how well he actually works uh, – interlinking with other players. That's not how Jumbuk was using him, but that's how Suwon's using him, and he's done well there. So he could fit into the system at Gangwon. And if, I mean, for me, if, if a citizen club like Suwon FC can afford him, there's no reason to think that Gangwon couldn't have got him in. And I, and I, and I just don't understand why they didn't do something. Right. Well, I think uh, Kim byung Su is one of those visionary managers. He's got, he's got his style of play, and he thinks things are going fine. If they're playing to his plan, he thinks they're going to win enough. He needs a bit of an intervention. He needs somebody to sit him down and say, look, you can't play tricky football all the time. If they finish in the relegation round again, I think that's got to be enough of an intervention. And, you know, I've always, I keep thinking I'd love to see what he could do with a a big club's money and their roster. But right now, I don't know. 
you know i don't know if that's what it would take but this is a team that has been up there we were even talking about them for the title at one point and they've just kind of fallen flat but those kits though am i right oh you're right yeah <laughs> Yeah, okay. They're they're at least winning that one, but yeah, let us know what you think. Should Kim Byung Soo be given? I mean, he'll be given the rest of the season, but I guess the way that I would put it is, should he be back for Gong One next year, or hey, mm-hmm. do you want to be harsh? Should he be gone now? Should we see what Pete Hampshire can do on the sidelines? <laughs> no one wants to say that. But like you say, Pete, I, I don't I don't think he's going to be gone this season. They're not in trouble for relegation, and there isn't really anybody there, but. I think it's going to be a massive offseason for Gangwon if they can't get this together and they can't figure out what to do. But we'll be talking about that and a whole lot more in a very full Old Julie Weiss mailbag right after a quick break. Old Julie Lewis is your neighborhood British bar and cafe located in the old Giro district of Seoul. Decorated in old English antiques and furniture for a true homely feel, you can enjoy homemade scones, cakes and afternoon tea during the day, and traditional British favorites like beef stew, English ale, and a fine selection of wines at night. Available for private parties or simply an evening out, Old G. Lewis is sure to become your favorite neighborhood pub. Be sure to mention Kayleigh United at the bar during your visit and you'll get 10% off your bill. Welcome back to the Kayleigh United Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Walters, joined by Dan Croydon. Hello. And Pete Hampshire. Hello. And gentlemen, we are binsless this weekend. No Matthew Bins, so I will be reaching into the Old G. Lewis mailbag and... Uh, our first one is actually from Patreon. It comes from Aaron Atch, or Ash. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I should know that. I don't, though. Anyway, I'm sorry. So he's asking, could you talk a little bit about the special status of Sangju Songmu? Will they be automatically relegated? And I think you said their home city wants them to move. Why is this? Um, yeah, so this is something we mentioned on the podcast a lot, and this is something good to touch base on for anybody that's new to K-League this year. Sangju Songmu, the military side, uh, that that's their special status. They're the military side. They get the cream of the crop now with the people serving military service that used to be Asan Magunghwa as well. They no longer do that. So Sangju gets the best of the best, which is why they're so much fun to watch this year. And yes, they will be automatically relegated this season because they are moving cities. Basically, Sangju didn't want the club there anymore, so they're going to be moving along, and that's why they're automatically being relegated. And that's why the AFC Champions League race is so interesting right now, because uh, that usually would be, f- well, first Son Mackley in, and then second and third would get a playoff spot. But right now, because Sangju Sangmu is in third, that means that that playoff spot could go all the way down to fourth. And if one of those teams above them wins the FA Cup, that's an automatic berth. So we could be looking at fourth and fifth being good enough for AFC Champions League this year, which... I have opinions about, but we'll go into it later. <laughs> anyway, that's the uh, that's the gist of Sangju right there. Again, something good to touch base on. So speaking of Sangju, our next question came in on Twitter. It's from Azri Furman, and he's asking, how would certain teams benefit with players returning from Sangju Sangmu? Before I turn this over to you guys, I will just say a shout out to Thomas Mark Antonio, who just recently wrote a piece about this. But Pete, I'll throw this one over to you. Which teams do you think would benefit yeah. most? A great piece by Tom, which I am going to regurgitate for you now. <laughs> the, the headline name was Kang Sangu. Yeah, it was at seven, seven goals and five assists at Sangju, and he'll be going to Pohang Steelers to apply his trade. Um, and I don't think anyone really expected him to be as quite as good as he was this season. No, nope. um, he got pushed out to the wing, didn't he? And cutting inside, he's, he took the penalties for them. I think. I think he scored against Guangzhou. Um, fantastic. So that's something for Pohang fans to look forward to. The other one, Han Suk Jung, who Sue on Blue Wings have just snapped up in central midfield. I mean, there's questions if they really need another central midfielder, but correct. they've got a tall, a tall, powerful player in there. But is he really the creative man that they need? I would suggest not. I think they need an attacking midfielder. Um, and also, Jeju are getting a couple of players from them. So that could help them in their push for promotion. Yi Chan Dong, who I had a little wave with when I went to uh, watch <laughs> Sangju. I went, I, went, I went for a weekend to Sangju and he, 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 me and my friend Christy Lung, he, uh, he gave us a little wave from the stands. I don't even know why, to be honest, but wait, he's a were... dependable... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So, sorry. <laughs> were you like shouting his name or was he just like, 
we just, we just kind of caught his eye when he went in. And then when they came out to train, we were sat there as the two foreigners in the stadium. And he just like, he just like a cheeky kind of chap. He just kind of gave us a wave. And then after that, we waved a couple more times. <laughs> we just made friends. <laughs> I think he's... <laughs> I think it's one of those cases where he's waving to his mum and sat behind you. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> Just but anyway, on, yep. the, on the on the pitch, he's, yep. he's a very solid and dependable defender. And also, Yu Sung-woo, who fans in Europe might know, he was at Bayer Leverkusen. He's not he hardly played at all for Sangju, but he'll be returning to Jeju as well. This is one of the things that uh, I don't love this about the setup with Sangju. I feel like. We should have this figured out by now that footballers, military service lasts until the end of the season. It's really bizarre yeah. to be getting them in in September, especially this year with a shortened season and everything else. It's this weird secondary transfer window that kind of like messes up teams transfer strategies for a little while and everything like this has got to be figured out i mean there's nothing that the players can do about it right now but from a league standpoint, I feel like it should just be when you're there, you're there for two seasons are like you can't i don't think we should have this other transfer window with military recruits leaving it's just so bizarre because you brought up kong sang Woo. he's already having a career year he's never had seven goals in a year before 81 percent passing accuracy right now and you're just he just gets chucked onto pohong after the transfer mm-hmm. window and like that's just such a massive boost for them i mean and good for pohong and i you know it'd be nice to see them back in champions league and everything else but it, it's not necessarily unfair but it kind of feels that way in a way for them to be getting a player of that caliber after the transfer window you know i was just gonna say it's also unfair on sangju yeah 100 they're losing that those players who they've worked with who kim taewan has settled into the side and then they just one week later they've gone right i just wonder what what the players think you know Kang sang is probably looking at the season of his career so far at, yeah. at Sanju. He probably wants to see it out, doesn't he? How you know, could you he, not? He, he feels like he's achieved something there, and but just to be to move away from it, perhaps he, he then thinks somehow it wasn't worth it. Yeah, because it's a strange situation to be sure. If he goes and does what a lot of, unfortunately, what a lot of Sangju players do once they leave, it kind of falls off a little bit outside of Sangju, then yeah, you got to wonder what the season's going to look like. It, it, yeah, it's a weird one. It's a real weird one there. Uh, but yeah, again, go ahead and read Tom's piece. It's on the website right now. Really good stuff. And uh, yeah, it'll be quite relevant this weekend. All right, moving on. This is usually how we start the mailbag, but we just chucked it in the middle. We got a question from the 94th minute on Twitter. And Dan, I feel like this one will be right up your alley here. Which uncapped player in K-League should be included in Paulo Bento's next Korean squad? Well, you, you got it right. Of course, I'm going to choose a, an Ulsan player. Of course. And it, it, it's got to be Wondu J. Yep. Wondu J, he's been absolutely superb. You know, yep. unsung hero, defensive midfield. We always say it's hard to give them MVPs and, and awards and things like that. Shouldn't but be. I think he's got a good a good shot at the, the best 11 come the end of the season. The guy is just slotted in there, 23 years old, but he looks like he's been playing in K-League 1 for, for years. There was a highlights package of him against Daegu, keeping Sazinia out of the game. Mm-hmm. He kept him in his pocket all, all evening. And there's some strength at the at an international level for, for the Korean national team in defensive midfield. He'd be up against Jusei John and, uh, and the lad out in Valencia. I can't remember his name now. Oh, Lee Kang-in? Lee Kang-in. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be hard for him to get in, but I, I think he's got to make the squad soon. He looks fantastic. For me, Lee Kang In could probably be bumped up a little bit. And the thing about it is, <laughs> both of those guys are so young. Like, if you're looking at the national team setup, especially, I don't think Korea is worried about qualifying. Get these guys in now. And like you were saying, Dan, it usually is difficult to award MVPs to sixes, to defensive midfielders, but. Wandu Jay got it in Thailand in January for the U23 championship, and, and rightfully so. And, yeah, like you say, I think he's got to be in that conversation. And to me, just get him in young. You know, why not? Juse Jung, love what he does, love watching him play. Right. But if, if you're giving me the choice right now of what I want to see on the national team when this team finally gets back together after all the things that we've all had to deal with this year— I want Wan Duje in there. I don't want Juse Jong in there. I mean, right. again, good on Juse Jong, but well, I think the time is now. 
Right. Bento has shown he's willing as well because he, he included Yvon Gong, another full time mm-hmm. player, um, for a couple of friendlies and played him out on the right wing. So he has shown that he is looking at, at uh, 23, 24 year olds. There's some other players he might include. I don't know if Pete's got some. I was going to say, Pete, I'll give, you a qu- a give, I'll give you a name because we're only halfway through the mailbag. So uh, yeah. well, you, I, you get a name I and say, I get a name. So go. Just going to say, Bento has been up to gang one a lot lately mm-hmm. the, you know the camera pans into him so he must be looking at i was looking at players a young j cho j1 but my name would be song min q from pohang oh okay all right i like that i also like the fact that you 100 percent just copied my notes because cho j1 is who i had there as well uh-huh. um i think <laughs> get the youth in there get them in there let's see how they do especially because they've done such good things under kim hak bomb but all right like i said we were only halfway through so let's move on here we've got todd wild next and he's saying if there is an enforced break in K-League due to the coronavirus situation, which we talked about at the top. So, again, as a recap of that, if we go up to level three here in Korea, that means that K-League has no choice but to shut down and all of us stay at home. Very, very sad. And FIFA 21's not out yet, so don't do this to me. Anyway, which sides might benefit or be hindered the most? And Pete, I'll start with you on this one. For hindering, I think the obvious one would be Incheon. They've just yeah. won two games in a row, the, the first wins of the season. That yeah. would be awful timing for them. Also, I think Busan, if if Dong Jun does leave, it gives him more time to leave if that sure. Portuguese club are sniffing around him. And that could just destroy their creativity up front. Uh, well, the, yeah, the obvious one is Incheon. But I think the title race might suffer as well, just because of the fixture congestion it, it would create near the top there. Both Jumbuk and Ulsan have to fit in FA Cup semifinals. Oh, They've yeah. got the ACL season. It's going to really uh, mess around with that scheduling. Is there anybody that you think would benefit from it? Anybody that would maybe get a little bit of a boost from time off? Maybe Daegu, uh, you know? I think Daegu just got into a little slump the last few games. and Cezania needs to get back into it. And Edgar's just getting back into match fitness. Mm-hmm. I think they could benefit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'd go for Daejun in the K2. Yes, need a bit definitely. Of time off. A bit more time to, to gel some of that squad together. I think that would uh, work out well for them. Well, you've led in perfectly to the next question we have, which is from James Edrup on Twitter, and he's asking, uh, well, he's saying, rather, that it would take a brave person to tip who's going up from K-League 2 this season. Dare to give it a go. So, again, we're running a little bit behind here, so you just get to say who's going to win the K-League 2. You have to say it right now. Dan, who you got? Dan Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you said you, right you're now so excited I, about it. Pete, who you got? You, you said you said right <laughs> now and I have my mouth open. <laughs> Day John. Okay. Dan. Young Nam. Oh. James will be happy. Young Nam and Jeju to win the playoff. Oh. Okay. Well, you're both wrong. You both mispronounced Junam. It's pronounced Junam. <laughs> or Junam, really. But no, I, I don't. You on that. It you. is a little bit, right? Chunum Dragons. It used to be CH. Now it's J. So we got to emphasize that. Boy, yeah, I don't know. I said Dejan preseason, so I'm going to stick with that. But I really think it could be Jeju. It's super fun this year. Love it. Speaking of Dejan, uh, up next, the question is from Dejan Citizen FC Brazil. And they're asking Leandro, Edinho, Marlone, which Brazilian playmaker can be the difference leading his team to K-League 1? So sticking in K2 here, which Brazilian player do you think is going to have the biggest influence? And Pete, since you're chomping at the bit for K2, I'm coming to you first on this one. (laughs) Um, I think Leandro is the one that's most impressed me. And if Eland are going to get into a playoff place, he's the one that will do it. Will he lead them to K-League 1, though? Because that's how the question ends. Leading his team to Uh, K-League 1. Are we going to see a Seoul Derby no. in K1 next year? No. Sorry, Michael Redmond. Ooh. No, they, they have slipped off a bit lately, haven't they? But yeah, Leandro is still key, man. Dan, what do you think? I've not seen much of this uh, Marlon at Suwon. Uh, yeah, he hasn't know, featured got, a ton. Uh, they got bigger names there. I'm going to go for Adino. They've just signed him in the window from uh, Fort Salela, I believe they're called in, in Brazil. Uh, what I do know is that he played alongside Gustavo the new huh? Dumbuck striker. Those two had quite a partnership. So if he can get something going with Andre Luis at, uh, at Bajon, they, they could have a, a good pairing there. I was going to say Andre Luis is my pick anyway. So there we go. Let's close that out there. Speak, <laughs> we're sticking to K2 here based on his question. Scott Whitelock came in and said, will Suwon ever appoint a new manager or are they waiting for the new K2 season to start? So 
I think he's he's on the doom and gloom side of things here, thinking that and when he says Suwon, he means Suwon Samsung Blue Wings, not Suwon FC. And I think this is a really interesting question because, like you say, Pete, who are they going to get in? Could you imagine the heel turn of Che Young Soo going down there? I mean, I was trolling through the names as I said earlier. There's Lee Hung Shil. There's uh, Kim Jong Bu, who had a good few years at Pyongyang when they sure went did. through a really interesting time. So some options, but I think like like a lot of clubs like Daegu, they're just going to trundle along with a caretaker yeah. and carry on to the end of this strange season. Yeah, that's what I think as well. Yeah, all right. It's all part of the downsizing. Uh, Suwon, Samsung, they've just been uh, you know, de-investing for a while now. Perhaps they're trying to do it without a manager now. Just going to say this again. City Football Group, I know you're listening. Suwon City, it's got a great ring. That used to be Suwon FC's name, but people already hate you, so you can deal with that anyway. <laughs> They're already in blue. They already it's play right. in blue. They're the blue wings. Everything is ready to go for you. I know you're listening. Just give them a call. That's all I'm saying. Speaking of giving them a call, the next question came in on Instagram. This is from Cam, who came in through the stories and is asking about our thoughts on Adam Taggart gaining interest from the Middle East. And yeah, Dan, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, I mean, why not? He's been, uh, he was rumored to go in the last transfer window mm -hmm. uh, in the off season. Things are not going well at Suwon at all. I don't think they've, the manager before Ian Seng really liked him. They didn't seem to get on well together. His international teammate, Mitchell Duke, has just moved out to the, the Middle East. So Taggart might be following him there. Yeah, why not? Yeah, to me, the, uh, I think it was a mistake not going before now. I think this winter should have been the time for that move because, I, I mean, I love Adam Tagger being in this league. I, I like him as a person. I like what he does as far as getting some eyes on this league in Australia. But to me, I think it, if K-League is going to be able to position itself as being able to curate and ship out talent, this is a perfect example. He came here. He won the Golden Boot. His stock was never going to be higher than it was this winter. And Suwon, like we said, they're Samsung pretty much in name only at this point. They, they need to be a selling club. And I, I don't know what happened this winter, but to me, that just looked like such an easy fit. The interest was there, and, and I don't know why they didn't move them then. And now, you know, the market's already depreciated because of COVID, and he's only scored five goals this year. So his value is just so, 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 so much lower than it was. So now it's at the point where if you're Suwon... It's like, well, is it worth selling? Whereas this winter, it was just a no-brainer for me, and I, it's just, it's just a bad bit of business. I don't, I don't get it. And I would like to add, if I was an international striker who was top goal scorer in the league, I would not like to be playing in such a, a defensive system with one up front. You know, you'd be, yeah, you'd be looking for a move, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I, I mean, again, I, I don't want to see him go. Uh, I. I think if they've got the money to pay him, FC Seoul would be a great fit. And boy, do I love those kind of narratives. Go from Suwon to Seoul. That, that'd be all sorts of fun. And I think he'd fit the system great there. So, uh, yeah, Adam Taggart, if you're listening, go ahead and get on the phone to FC Seoul. Just asking people to make these phone calls for me, please. Anyway, we got one more here. And speaking of being shameless, George Slade came in. He had a shameless plug for himself here. And he's asking, which country do you think it's most surprising that have never had a K-League player? And he's asking this because George has put out a really fun piece uh, also on kleagueunited.com. And uh, he's asking, he went over the countries that haven't had a K-League player yet. And, I, and I've got my answer here. And I don't want to go through the whole list because people can go ahead and read it. But uh, Dan, who, which country were you surprised to see on this list of uh, players that haven't represented their country in K-League? Well, I'm going to go and stick close to home. Um, there has been plenty of English players, uh, but there's no one from Scotland, Wales, or Ireland. I'm yeah. surprised there hasn't been a spot. We had Niall McGinn, mm -hmm. uh, who came from the Scottish League, but he was Northern Irish. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, Scotland, uh, the Scottish divisions, K-League, they're a bit of a similar level, I would say. So, I'm, yeah, but I'm surprised. Pete? I feel like I'm going to be copying your notes again here, Ryan, but I've okay. gone for Qatar. Qatar, the Asian Cup holders from 2019. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, normal, normally after a year where a nation wins something, their top players get picked off by the top 
leagues in that continent, which the K-League is one of those. So I just expected, you know, one of the top names from that team would end up here. Yeah, you would assume so. Um, yeah, you're, you're hitting close. Um, unfortunately for me, I'm not that surprised, but I, I think Singapore being on this list surprised me a little bit not having had a Malaysian player. But then again, Southeast Asian players not coming here doesn't surprise me that much because K-League teams just don't want to seem to take the leap. Uh, I think we're going to have an entire podcast about that soon because I am upset and I need to have my <laughs> I need to have my yearly vent about not taking advantage of the ASEAN player quota. But for me, it's actually a little bit closer to uh, my native homeland. And um, nobody from Panama. I think a Panamanian defender, oh, man, I'd love to see that in this league. Because CONCACAF, boys, CONCACAF, is, those are some interesting Champions League games. And I would love to see a Panamanian international, especially, come over here and just lock down the defense. It'd be great. Would just love it. So, England played them in the last World Cup, and they basically tried to wrestle us. They gave away penalty after penalty. From- <laughs> <laughs> were- yeah, man. The... <laughs> That's what, When people talk about the U.S. easily qualifying for the World Cup, they have not seen an away day in Panama, for example. It's, it's interesting, and it's all sorts of fun. But those are just three. There are a ton of other countries on there. And again, uh, that's another plug there. So thanks to George for writing that one, an interesting read. And speaking of interesting reads, well, if you would like to get a few more of those, well, we do have some exclusive pieces coming up on Patreon soon. And speaking of Patreon, a big welcome to our newest patron, Steve Kramer. Welcome, welcome. I don't know if we'll give like the lifeline for the Survivor series at this point, because a lot of us are down to one life. But anyway, welcome aboard. Uh, Other things you get on Patreon are full player interviews and podcast extras, including the rundown of the episode before we record it. K-League Survivor is currently still going on there. The three of us are still alive, barely. I've been on One Life, I think, for like a month because of Gangwon, as Pete pointed out. Gangwon and Suwon. Man, why would I ever think... Anyway... So that's all sorts of fun. You can get in on that and a bunch of other things. We're going to have another pub quiz on there soon. We're going to have another Zoom quiz with uh, our patrons soon as as we're all looking at another lockdown potentially. So if we're all going to be inside, then we're going to do a pub quiz together. So tiers start as low as $1, $3, or $5. Get involved there. If you'd like to listen to this podcast live, you can do so every Thursday on Football Nation Radio down in Australia. And if you subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you download your podcasts, you will be entered into September's Kaylee Kit Contest. Sorry about August. There were plans for this one. I will just say that uh, September, we've got something special planned. I can't I can't let the cat out of the bag just yet. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Just got confirmation. Just got a got a nice email about it today. So we'll we'll have a fun one in September. So if you're if you're in on there, then uh, we'll, we'll get you in on that automatically. But yeah, stay tuned there. I can't confirm it yet. Not a hundred percent, but we're very close to having a nice fun giveaway for September. But for now, for Pete Hampshire and Dan Croydon, I'm Ryan Walters. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, my God.